quit this stuff for a moment. Uh, welcome to day two of the week of Pools on Players. I'm trying to fundraise for cats protection. And working on some open source software while I'm doing that. Um, yesterday I mostly tied up um, unpaper work for the week. I may go back to unpaper later on this week because as it turns out we have some stuck situation with Travis CI and everybody's migrating away from Travis CI so I may as well do that myself. Today instead we are working on USB mount tools and I'll start with a bit of an introduction of what this is about. Give me just a second. And this is when Streamlabs doesn't recognize Edge. There we go. Okay, I guess I'll have to fix codings as well. As I was saying, for the whole week, I'll be streaming every day, uh, 7.30 London time, except Saturday and Sunday that will start earlier. And if you want to look at the streams afterwards, they all be on playmice.tv. It is just a link to the YouTube channel. Hopefully the background noise today is reduced, if not gone. The chair has been mostly oiled, it still squeaks like no tomorrow. If anybody has a suggestion on what to do on an IKEA Marcus chair to stop it from squeaking, I'm all ears. Please let me know, because I have no idea. And otherwise, let's go and get started. So, USB mount tools, what is it? It's a set of libraries and tools, which is yeah, not very well documented. Um, it's mostly designed to deal with Linux USB mount, as in USB monitoring traces. On Linux, you can write down a file with all the USB traffic, the USB capture of all the data that is sent and received on a particular USB controller. You cannot really do it per port, you can do it per controller. Um, and the way you usually do it is using the pickup, the, the pickup package and using either T Shark or I think there is one of the pickup tools, so we can do it as well. For various reasons, this is not obvious to implement. And the way I've been dealing with this myself is I just wrote my own tool for it. Um, so USB modules has ways to read. This is the, the structure. It has a bunch of code that is there to read from a pickup ng files, which is how you usually save this stuff. Um, but it also has the way to, oh, sorry, not this one. It has a way to access this, extract the pickup ng data into a different file. And in addition to this one, I also wrote a different Pipe packet, which I now forgot actually the full name of. I keep forgetting the full name of. Yeah, Siphon Linux USB mod. This one implements mostly the. Um, oh, you don't pass checks for whatever reason, so I need to actually go and fix that. Um, but this one has an implementation with the source, it's in Siphon, as the name uh, suggests. I do like Siphon for extensions like this to deal with AOCTLs and everything. It has a capture command line tool using click because it's easy. Um, and that's pretty much it. Like there isn't really much more to this, it just reads the file and just writes them out somehow. It doesn't quite do pickup ng write out because Again, a bunch of reasons in writing out the correct pickup ng file for this is not obvious. Um, it's 
not just the pickup ng format that you need to look after, there are actually other things in addition to that that make it complicated, and so I never have spent time into that for now. Again, this is not going to be the main topic for the day. The main topic for the day is instead, yeah, that's the Marcus chair. Um, the main topic for the day is getting chapter out of the CP2102 um, files. Do I have anything in test data that I can show you? Well, maybe this one or not, I'll see. Um, what is the chapter files? The chapter files are, Pretty much just pickup and pretty much the same as the pickup ng, just not quite. Um, I use chapter files, or rather, I <coughs> did I invent the format? I don't think I really invented the format. Chatter files are just an easy way for me to visualize the back and forth between a device and the computer. And it's not really much into them, they just literally take the whole stream. It's useful for things like HID devices if you want to just go down to like the reports that are sent back and forth and we just remove all of the details that you don't really care that much about when you're just trying to figure out what the device and the computer are telling each other. Um, I've been doing this kind of set up for many years now. Um, I produce chapter files out of USB Lizer, which is a Windows USB capturing software. And when I stopped doing USB Lizer files, I've just been getting normal chapter files out of pickup ng. So nothing particularly sophisticated, but they're very handy to have. I have, in particular, under tools, a chapter for generic HID, and I have a chapter for CP2110 devices. 2110 devices, um, they're a Silicon Lab CP2110, and I had spoken about those in the blog. They are the ones used by the Glooper X Nexus Q. But I have, here it is, a particular update from 2019, which I recently updated. The Silicon Lab CP2110 is a very interesting chip because it is a UART, so a serial port implemented though as an HID um, device, um, human, inter in, human interfacing, human interaction this device human something device, pretty much. Um, your keyboard, your mouse are HID devices. And for the most part, HID was designed to allow you to send data to the computer, but has been retrofitted, let's call it that way, to send data to a device as well. There are lots of things that implement HID-based protocols because most operating systems allow access to HID devices without needing a fully privileged driver. So you can implement most things as an HID back and forth, but you don't need to install any driver on Windows when you install your software, just install your software and then say, hey, I want to talk to an HID device that is set this way and that way, and I'll just send and receive HID reports, which are essentially HID protocol packets. Um, with the parameters I'm giving you. There is a lot more to HID than that. HID allows to define the schema of a reports in such a way that you can say, hey, this device has eight buttons. Or if the device is broken, this device has five buttons. And then we report three more that don't exist in the schema I just gave you. This is what happened with the Elecon trackball devices, by the way. So there are a number of additional features that HID supports. Silicon Labs doesn't really use most of those. They just use a straight custom report. Like this is happening. It's essentially a bunch of 
one byte reports but sends the back and forth of the serial protocol. Just instead of sending it as a raw USB packet, it's sent as a HID report. And the device I'm going to work on is the CP2104 instead, which is a proper serial USB to serial adapter. I don't have a shutter extractor for that, but I assume it's going to be pretty much the same, except not quite. Now, the good thing with Silicon Labs is that usually you can find their um, application notes, but include the whole protocol. So if you, if we look at the CP2110, yeah, AN434, yeah, the link is still valid. This is the CP2110 or 2114 interface specification. It has all the details, all the settings, all the pin settings, and so on. Now, the question is, do they have one for the CP2104? And the answer seems maybe not. Yeah, it says CP2102 and it's probably that it is not in this oh, relevant application notes. This may be um, USB Express API and interface, zero communication guide. Uh, so maybe the AN197. Let's see. Uh, no, no, this uses the com driver, so it doesn't actually. So maybe the AN169 would be the one that has. Yeah, this is the whole device implementation. It does, I don't think this one has the actual lower level USB details. Okay, so we will have to start from very, very, very basic stuff. Before I get to the actual code, since this week is here in favor of cats protection, please donate at playmice.com slash cats. We'll send you fruit filter pie. I don't see anything of that, don't worry. Uh, let me just leave you with the cat video provided by Cat Protection then. And this time it worked. So, I have a new blue chemical device over here, which is by Menarini Diagnostics. It's a blue comment I wrote. It comes with the separate USB serial adapter cable ish thingy, which is not uncommon. Essentially, I will say half of the glucometers with a serial cable that uses PRS, either three and a half or two and a half millimeters jacks. This one comes with the serial cable that uses the CP2104 or CP2102, it 
CP two one zero X serial device, which is fairly common. It's fairly cheap, very easy to use in design. I I use it in my own design. I have a bunch of PCBs over here that use it. I have a ESP forty two based acrylic lamp mainboard that still doesn't work, by the way. Um, I will get back to that probably later this week. That one uses the CP2104 chip on it. It's fairly decent. One of the good things about it is that it includes both the whole USB stack protocol included in the chip, so you don't need to do anything except connecting the plus D minus. But also it has in chip voltage regulation, so you can just connect the 5 volts to it, you get the 3.3 volts on the other side which I needed for the ESP42, so it's one chip that does nearly everything. This particular board that I have over here has literally um, 3, 4, 5 capacitors, 4 resistors, and um, I actually don't know how to define it, it's multiple Zener diodes, it's one chip that is used on, as ESD protection from the USB. But essentially all there is with it. The CP102 does most of the work. And that part works fine and great. The only thing it overheats if you have a short somewhere. Even on my Rex MPX, don't ask me why. Um, I have noticed that, but it's a bit annoying. Anyway, I've used it not just for this one, I have a couple of other boards that I don't actually have on the table right now. That includes the CP102. But I usually use with the Sale because they are essentially Sale to serial. Well, they are an easy way to connect something that needs a serial connection and go through the Sale to get a copy of all the messages. That's for another time. Um, I received, I recorded one of the, or captured one of the USB traffic from. The virtual machine to the glucometer, and I have a file for it, which is this one, and it is a, yeah seven megabytes of pickup file. Going through it is going to take a while, so let's start with actually installing this thing properly. I cloned it. I didn't create the VM yet, so let me do that. Uh, it was working last time. Uh, I think it's the end now. Let's try again. This time it created it. And to 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 now yes select the VF and if I now control there we go this one activates the VM I do like in VS code if you set up the VM correctly this works. This will install all the tools, including recommit. Quite a few of them. Hmm. Oof. Fail to build constructed stamp. Oh, it goes it falls back to install it separately. Successfully installed, hex dump 3.3 and construct to 10.61. Work commit install. And that one is set up. What do we have here? The env is not ignored locally and the S code is not in the ignore file. So let's start with that. Dot .vs code. 
and also that's what we have because I put it in fact as being where to put it. And I also need to update the pre commit the same way as I had on um, paper. So let's wait for this to install everything. I'm gonna do the same. Okay, then end of found and white space, everything passed, everything and everything else has been ignored. Let me just see what versions I used for all of this. Okay, so this should be 340. FSFE risk means I've been using this version yesterday, so it should do fine. Let's see whether we rest need updating. I think we do. I sort changed where it is and also where it should be used. Because now it's no longer emotes only. So it's the correct one. And the latest tag is 580 three days ago. This one is now PSF flag. And the latest tag is 28B1. This is on GitLab. Or never mind. And this is 390. And this one garbage. Rerun with the updates. This is unfortunate, but I don't really develop this daily anymore, so it gets in the way. But probably adds to my frustration of why, why I haven't been doing as much loss as I would have liked to do. Okay, uh, ooh, it reformatted a lot of stuff um, and changed sorts. So that's what's going on here. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, but one doesn't really make that much sense, I will say, but never mind. Uh, this one is fine, this one is fine, fine. Yeah, okay. Okay, this part is done. Now, I do have a USB mount tools, a USB mount capture set that I can run on the file and it will tell me something about it. Tell me, yeah, there are a lot of addresses, there are a lot of descriptors. They don't say much about the descriptor, it just says what the descriptor are. Um, and unfortunately, I don't actually resolve the USB ideas, which is a bit annoying. So, 
out of personal experience by now, um, 10C4 is Silicon Labs, or rather recognized by EA60, which is the CP2104. So this device, 115, is the device that has the traffic we care about. There are a lot of other devices on this thing. And the reason for that is that on Linux, you cannot actually go and capture the data only for one particular device. There is no filtering capability. Yes, you can use T Shark or Wireshark to capture and apply a filter in visualization, but it doesn't support capturing only a particular device on the filter side because there is no BPF support on the USB MON interface. I have considered trying to learn a lot more about BPF and USB MON to try to get it to work. I kind of gave up on that because I don't have the energy of this time to deal with the confrontational style of the Linux mailing lists anymore. Um, so I'll leave that to someone else. On the bright side, this is our device. We know that it is one one one. 5 is the address of a device that we care about. 142, it's this device over here, and I have a feeling from the number of events here that it is my trackball. Because you can see here that most of, most of the data comes from 142 and 112, and 112 is 0131. And then you can see that most of this, like the isochronous one. Isochronous? Really? Oh. Yeah, I hadn't considered that. When I did this capture, I was using the, mic the, the mixer that I'm using for the microphone right now as my audio sound card for my Linux machine because I have a NAC and like my options were the speakers on the monitor itself or external speakers in like very roundabout ways. So I just set it up with the Sub-Zero with USB as the external sound card, which is a bit messy and like now I'm not using that because I'm using it to capture the mic. But that means that all of this isochrono stuff you see here um, is actually, which is this one for two here, they're all isochronous. Um, the isochronous USB stream is essentially anything that has sort of kind of real-time needs. And that means, yeah, it's usually audio or video. And in this case, it was most likely audio. So 114, it's this thing over here. Let's just out of curiosity, I'll put this one on Bing search. Actually, no, it's a wireless receiver. Wireless receiver. Makes no sense. Um, oh, it may be the keyboard. Yeah, it could be the keyboard. Uh, that's interesting. I didn't realize I was clipping that much. Um, oh, yeah, 142 was the one that I was. So 14 is this one. And yes, that's the Texas Instrument PCM 2902C audio clock. So that's fine. That is not what we care about. We do care about this one, 115. Um, so let me start by getting. So the USB MON capture stats, if I remember correctly, I did it. How oh, did I not implement it on that? Damn it. Um, I usually have implemented on the tools a filtering. So if you look at the Chatter HID one over here, I have an address prefix that says on the match device with a given address prefix. I didn't add that to capture stats. So let me do that. Uh, no, not this one. Um, the CP2110, as I was saying, it's a specialized HID chatter. Um, and the specialized, I mean, it is 
not just the code in the HID chapter itself, it's also like filtering down particular transfer types because we know that that's the one that HID will use and will decode what the, um, the meaning of the single HID report are, which usually is just the input and output from the serial, but it can also be like, I'm going to configure the serial with these parameters. And usually you don't need that information, but it is handy to have it. So I like I implemented it and make sure that it gets out of that. Uh, so let me just copy exactly the same thing, the address prefix here. Um, prefix match applied to a device address in text format, my packet to the search definition matching this prefix will be printed out. Awesome. Yeah, the PyLens thinks that this code is unreachable. Pylance is wrong because people can still try to run this with the older Python versions. So let's make this go here. And if somebody had any doubt, yes, I do copy paste from my own code all the time. It's properly typed with my Python support for everything. The only thing I'm not going I'm going to check. So this This is part of a USB mon library I wrote for this. Well, it went just a bunch of counters and then it parses the string. Let me capture that. This will use the Python pickup ng module, the Python pickup ng library, um, to extract the data from a pickup file and then it will apply some decoding of the structures because the raw Linux captures are a bit of a mess when it comes to data. I already spoke about that some months ago. You can look up the old videos about this, but essentially USB mount capture on Linux is a mess. And so I tried to normalize a few entries. I also add a few more. I can read a Windows capture as well as a Linux capture. There is a different format for USB captures on Windows. And the reason for that is that both the Linux and the Windows one, they just dump the state that the kernel sees of the USB transactions and doesn't do any like normalization of the data. So I'm doing that myself over here. I know there are other libraries that do that. I wrote this a couple of years ago when I was trying to work on a bunch of things. The stuff I saw from other developers is a bit more complicated, maybe a bit more advanced, but it wasn't working when I tried it. This one works. People are happy to go and take it. If not, I'll keep using it myself. That's essentially all there is to it. So, as I was saying, this thing opens the session and just goes through all of the packets. Now, if you look over here at where the address prefix is used, it just checks that the submission starts with it. Actually, it doesn't like it doesn't look if it's a source or destination. It just checks the submission there because this is all paired up in pairs. So on this one, I'm going to change it slightly different. Well, I have a packet address anyway. So if if not address starts with address prefix continue and this should help me doing oh I guess I need to be reinstalled by hand it seems. Address, oh, dash prefix. There we go. This now ignores pretty much everything else. It still goes through the whole list of devices because it tries to find all the devices that are present in the session. It's annoying. There is no metadata about the device presence. Pickup and G has in the 
definition of the format itself, the ability to say, hey, these are the devices you're going to encounter in the following capture. It doesn't require you to use it. It also has no way to use it in USB mode in Linux because it just uses downstream of the buffer that is coming straight from the kernel. You could both process it afterwards to add it, but none of the tools that I know of will do that. I was considering writing a new pickup ng format that just takes Windows or Linux USB captures and just write down a, a new one as output, but I have not bothered. The library allows you to consume both of them. It will take a little longer to just pre-parse them to find all the devices. That works. And even that I'm working on this on my spare time, or not even my spare time, like I'm, I'm literally just going through this now after months since the last time I touched USB mount tools and I was going to do it anyway, not just because of cat's protection, but I thought this would be a good idea. So again, if you are watching this, please donate to cat's protection. And as I was saying yesterday, if we reach a thousand pound, I will start the stream from Linux afterwards. And I will be blogging about all of the problems that I'll find with trying to get it to work on Linux because I'm sure I'll encounter all kinds of issues, despite the fact that I'm not even using Gentoo anymore, I'm using OpenSUSE. Anyway, uh, let's go back to this. So the devices are all there. Now we know that that particular device has 598 receive and 254 send. Um, that's the direction in and out. They kind of match where I think. There are some bulk bulk messages and there are some control messages where are no interrupt messages. This is important because if you look at the chatter heap here, the transfer types for heap are actually interrupt and control. So we're not going to get any interrupt. This uses bulk. And this is one of the places where things get a bit annoying because if you need to send or receive bulk directly from Python, you need to use the USB which is complicated. Now, on the bright side, these just need a serial connection. And I'm fairly sure that I will be able to get this to work with any other serial port adapter I have, as long as it's two and a half millimeters. I have not written down yet which one is tip, which one is ring, and which one is lead. I'm ready to bet that this lead is just ground because that's the standard. And most of others, let me show you what I mean. Then one touch, uh, neither of these actually. The PG star I don't have, the SD code 3 has that type of connector. This is only the code 3 that I have over here. Well, this one has tip and has receive and ring to transmit. And I have not written down anything. Oh, and look, the SD code 3 cable is actually exactly the same, the same cable. It's a 10C4, which is Silicon Labs, EA60. And if I go back to the code, there we go, EA60. So yeah, this is not uncommon. I have, as it turns out, a different cable that uses exactly the same because it's a two and a half millimeter. Yeah, uh, it's a two and a half and a half millimeter jack, TRS jack, standard. You'll find it all the time. It's still the same. Like I, I have a dozen glucometers at this point. They all kind of work the same. Anyway, back to the code. So this allows us to have this is what this way.
Okay, this is part one, just starts with King of the Now let's see if I can extract the chapter. So I'm going to state file as and it wouldn't be chapter cp 21 x Let's call it cp 21 x because I don't know which one of it is going to be. There are multiples. So this is going to be 2021, not 2019 at this point. So let's take these two. Uh -huh. And this is going to be both. Most of the rest will be pretty much the same. Address prefix, file, version, parsing. Submission and callback. Now on this one can use some F string while I'm at it. I know what you're thinking if you're watching this uh, and you've looked at F strings and login before. By doing it this way, I'm no longer lazily evaluating the parameters to login me back because I'm forcing the formatting to happen anyway. This is very minimal and it's easier to read as an F string. Yeah, I, it's just that the tag is a UUID. Um, it's a UUID object that I just generate while matching submission and callbacks in the library because the original tag that Linux kernel provides is the pointer to the in-memory structure and it's they used so it's not unique so this one is just a unique tag it, yes it lazily evaluating that is not particularly useful so submission address starts with address prefix so that's fine um, okay this one has the if it is a control it has a separate set of packet of class, it passes it otherwise continue. And otherwise it is interrupt, which in our case instead it's pull. Um, and then it comes to packet submission or callback. Okay, let's see what happens when I do this. This is going to be very dark. So let me oh do I need to and do I need to need to add this to the config file. X, Did it install? No. I need to install it. Yeah, no, it's fine. So if I do this one, it's 1.15, there we go. And this is the input output. It's not nice. If you look at it, it just. So this is a um, device to host. You see the, the direction here. It's 00H, no, sorry, 00 sent from the device, and the reply from the host of the device is, seems to be H2. 5B, 0D, okay, 0D, 0A. These are useful. Um, Uh, 
Okay, okay, okay. Please wait. This zero zero a means sent from the device to the host again, which is actually this pipe d zero d zero a. This is useful because zero d is carriage return and zero a is line feed. That means that this is actually part of a protocol, so we know that this is decoding stuff correctly. It's sending a lot of zeros for d. Again, this is device to host. And then it sends other stuff. It's very difficult to read. You can see that the host then sends something, and the host sends it as a single packet with all the details. This is not uncommon for this kind of CD adapters. It turns out it was uncommon on the CP2110. But on the CP2102 and other devices like that, it's common that every single byte gets streamed straight into the host, but when the host writes, it buffers to a point and just writes the whole thing. I don't know what this... Well, okay, no, I do know what this is. Um, 21.03.03.2028 was the date and time. So this is trying... Oh, this is probably reading the the date yeah again this is like a brief window into my mind when i'm trying to reverse engineer a protocol like this i have a long stream of bytes that are even difficult to read right now and i'm going to fix that in a moment but most importantly then i see a matching stream of bytes coming from the host to the device and they are setting the date and time because 2103 or 2028 means 8 p.m. well 8:28 p.m. on the 3rd of March 2021. Admittedly, I could have done this in any other day that was not the 3rd of March, as in 0303, and then I would have known if it's trying to set this as a normal date of year's month day, or if it's going to do something silly like year's day month. I've seen all kinds of things. I have no idea what this 84 means yet, but it also means that it's decoding most of it in, in ASCII, not all of it, but most of it. This here again is 0D0A, and there is another 0D0A here, so this, and this is also 0D0A, so it's doing this as ASCII, putting new lines in between groups of data, I'm not quite sure. And this is the confirmation coming from like from device suite P. So this already gives us something. And this was literally just me taking the old chatter file, the old chatter script, and just changing it to use both instead of interrupt. That's it. That was the easiest change, right? That only gives us so much because as I said, all of these are one byte after the other. Now, if we look back at chapter CP212, this one. 2110. Okay, this has more stuff like the print the UART config packet, which we haven't done on this one. Among the things I haven't seen it. So that's going to be the other fun part to work on. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but it also reconstructs the payload. So this is where things get a little more complicated over here. Because, as I said, it's not uncommon for these devices to send byte by byte. This happens all the time. You want to have to know like the whole packet that the whole stream that gets sent until the other side of the device is replying. So from the host we already see it packet as a single set of strings. But we don't get the equivalent on the other side. We don't get each message coming from the device. We get each byte coming from the device, which is not easy to read. And so the CP2110, which does this thing on both directions, both send and receive, only send byte by byte. I 
made this trick of using the direction. Um, so this one is less optional. So over here, and yes, this one also have a, if you don't have the address, try to guess the address by looking for the development ID and the full product ID. I will add that as well. But for now, let's start with the important part. So here, submission director direction is done to packet submission or callback. This one is slightly different, but it does the same thing. Well, actually, I want this whole block over here. So this prints the dump bytes, direction, reconstructed packet, and then reset direction and reset the dump packet, the reconstructed packet. And then again, it sets the direction to be the same as the submission, not the callback, and then it calculates the payload one way or the other. This is specific to the CP2110. The First byte of a payload is the report itself, and then if the report is between 0 and 0x3f, which is 63, um, it means that that's the length of the rest of the payload. This makes no sense because the report could easily just have had like, one report and then the length. And honestly, given that it seems to only ever use one byte at a time, all of the things that I tested when I tried to build my own or using the official tool, everything sends byte by byte and receives byte by byte, so it's only one report, report one. But never mind, so that's the specific part on um, its side. On this side, we don't need any of that, so we can just do the construct, the constructed packet plus equal submission payload or constructed packet callback payload. And then we can remove this part over here and this. And at the end, because there is always going to be a last reconstructed packet. So if we do this now and then try again, there you go. This is a little more interesting. Um, it's missing one thing which is, I should have probably put a print in between these. Did I forget a random print there or? Okay, maybe this thing needs an extra print here. Otherwise, it's very difficult to read, but let's try again. Okay, better. At least for me, this is better. It groups each time it turns around between... Maybe a hex dump change? I'm actually not sure. Uh, but it groups each set of device to host and host to device traffic. So we can see here that the device sends 0 and the host answers with A2. And A2 is interesting because I don't think, yeah, A2 is not an ASCII character, so I don't know what that means. But at A2, the device is sending a bunch of data out, including this, well, none of these appears to be a serial number, but, oh no, sorry, I'm wrong. This is the serial number, so this EQ667115 is the serial number of the device. So there you go, we already find the serial number. I don't have it written on the back, but I assume, I'm trying to see the small hint, doesn't have anything, but I assume that this is like a software version or something along those lines. This is repeated because the host probably reset it. Uh, And now this makes a little more sense. I think this may be like the count of tests. I don't have anything like that right now. So yeah, we'll 
we'll have to figure it out a little better later. And this asks the device something, once again, I don't know. Like this says the only useful information on this one is the not a 5D, because 5D, 5D are the square brackets, which somehow just seems to be start and end of the message. They say like square brackets, start the message. Square bracket, new line, Sierra left. Then the message, then new line, then something else. So that's a bit strange. Particularly because the rest is not ASCII, like this is 93D. And like this is all hex. And you can see here that 90 hex is not part of the base ASCII. So that's not a thing. 3D is this equal here, and then there is another new line. Then 5D new line. But that gives us a little bit of the insight of how this protocol works at all. It's a serial based protocol, which is somehow non ASCII safe, but also using ASCII constructs uses the square brackets to start and end the message and it uses CRLF between lines to gather fields together. And then somehow uses comma to separate stuff as well because over here it's using commas to separate this serial number over here from something else. So that's already something. And this is essentially the basis where I go to reverse engineer devices like this. Now, I am running out of time. I was planning on spending some time tomorrow looking at a bunch of Home Assistant related things. So this will probably be back on Thursday, where I will try to have, uh, as I said on Twitter the other day, I will be bleeding for my heart, for, for my art, because I will need some measurement that I can read from the device. I will get more traces from the device. Um, with like downloading the data and setting the time at different times. That's usually a good test to figure out if there are like timestamps and things. The one thing that I don't have an answer to on from this code right now is is this year, month, day, or day, month, uh, year, day, month, which will be very silly, but as I said, I've seen worse. So most of that will be easy. So on Thursday, I would expect we'll use this tool over here to write a driver for the single commentary utils. Because I will have had enough time to build up the pickup files. And I'm not going to do both lives because I will probably be bleeding quite a bit. And also I want some hours in between them so I can see if there are timestamps. And then I'll go back to that. And once again, I'll be here the rest of the week until Saturday, um, 7.30 London time. On Saturday at 4 p.m. London time, Sundays 4.30 London time, or vice versa, actually. Uh, let me just double check. Oh, sorry. Cats. You can see here the target is still. Oh, nobody has donated to that one. I need to change the thing though. Somehow it doesn't automatically update. Uh, we are aiming to 1000 pounds for me to stream from Linux and blog about the experience. Full schedule is over here. It's 4 30 on Saturday, 4 p.m. on Sunday. And on Sunday, depending on how many things I manage to deal with during the week, I may add more or less hours because if there are just a few things to tie up, I will tie them up on Sunday. Please join me donating to Cast Protection, and I hope to see you here tomorrow. Enjoy the evening or the day, everybody.